You're welcome to class, everyone. Welcome to the class on uh, Romans. Uh, we are now studying Romans chapter 6. We began studying Romans chapter 6 on Monday, a very powerful uh, chapter, a uh, chapter that is so fully, powerfully loaded with such powerful truths of our uh, spiritual uh, identification with uh, Christ. And uh, so even as we continue um, studying this chapter, receiving more revelations from what the Holy Spirit revealed to the Apostle Paul. We'll just uh, pause for a word of prayer. Uh, can John Paul lead us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this time. We pray and ask for your presence to be with us today, God, as we <clears throat> continue to learn from your word. We ask that you would lead us, you would guide us, and and let your presence be with us, O oh God. And we ask that, O oh Lord Jesus, your word would come in power and you would teach us and help us to understand your word, comprehend your word, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So in chapter 6, uh, Paul is basically addressing the main issue of the problem of uh, sin. And he does this by posing two main questions. The first question is in um, verse 1, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And the second main question is uh, in verse 15, where he says, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace. Now, to answer these two main questions, he has some follow-up questions. So the, the first question in verse 1, there's um, follow-up questions uh, in verse 2 and verse 3. And um, for verse 15, that's the main uh, question that he asked. There's follow-up questions in verse 16 and verse 21, which we will study. Okay, so in verse 1, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So he's asking a rhetorical uh, question here. That means the answer is quite uh, evident. It's quite obvious. The answer is an absolute no. He says, why uh, shall we not be able to continue in sin? Is he saying, because we are dead to sin and dead people uh, do not sin and that people just cannot sin because they are dead. The second thing he says that we are baptized into Christ's uh, death. And here he's not talking about water baptism, but he's talking about um, a spiritual baptism where he's saying that we have been baptized into uh, the death of Jesus Christ. So uh, by saying that, you know, he's um, saying that when we uh, come into Christ, when we are born again, we are now uh, identified or we are identified with Christ's death, we are, which means we are baptized into his death. And this is a powerful expression or a powerful proclamation of the spiritual truth of our identification with Christ's death his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the seating of Christ Jesus at the right hand of God. Okay, So all this is something that happened 2,000 years back. But, you know, uh, Paul says, even today, we can experience the effects of what happened 2,000 years back. Just like, you know, what Adam and Eve did 6,000 years back, we still, uh, uh, you know, um, under the effects of the sin that Adam and Eve uh, uh, came under and under sin, under judgment, under condemnation, uh, uh, being slaves to sin, being slaves to Satan, and being slaves to death. Even as we have inherited that, 6,000 years back because of the disobedience of one man, how much more the obedience of one man and what he did on the cross 2,000 years, we uh, receive the benefits of that. What he did on the cross becomes effective in your life and in my life uh, today. So he's basically talking about this powerful expression or this powerful proclamation, the spiritual truth of our identification with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, and seated at the right hand of God the Father. Of course, uh, in this chapter, in uh, chapter 6, Paul mentions how we identify with Christ's death, his burial, 
his ascension, but uh, we also see he mentions about the spiritual truth of our identification, of how we um, have uh, been raised up together with Christ, you know, um, in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 6, that we are seated with him, together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in those um, chapters, we, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, talks about how we are made alive, even though we are dead in our trespasses, in our sins. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, he talks about how we are raised up together, made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ uh, Jesus. So uh, in that verse, we see how we are also united with him in his ascension and him being seated at the right hand of God the Father. Okay. So we looked at, was we studied in detail verses 1 uh, to verse 5. Now we move on to chapter, oh, sorry, verses 6 and verse 7. Can somebody please read verses 6 and verse 7, please? Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Can somebody read that? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Amen. Thank you, Subhashi. So here we see that Paul is saying, uh, you know, beginning this uh, sentence by saying that, you know, knowing this. So many uh, believers don't know this truth. And this is something that we need to know. Uh, without knowing or having a revelation or spiritual understanding of the truth, we will not be able to walk in it. And he talks about the old man versus the new man, which I already explained um, last week. But we will move on to verse 6, where it says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now, the body of sin basically is, uh, represents the sum totality of sin, okay? The sum totality of a sin. Now, in the New Testament, uh, the body, the word body is spoken in different ways. It can, in some places, refer to the physical body. In some places, it can refer to the body of Christ that represents all the believers that are part of the church or the body of Christ. Or like in this instance here in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it talks of the sum totality of something or the full measure of something. Okay, So that is the way it is used here. So the body of sin might be done away with means the sum totality of uh, sin was done away with or the full measure of sin was done away with. It was gotten rid of. So Paul is saying that, hey, it is gotten rid of, it is done away with, hence we are no longer slaves of sin. So verse 6 is so powerful, this, uh, this truth, that as believers, we are no longer slaves of sin because why the old man was crucified and the totality of sin was taken out of our life when you and I died with Christ on the cross, uh, this is what happened. The old man was crucified and the totality of sin was taken out of our lives. Okay, So as believers, we are no longer a slave of sin because the sum totality of sin was done away with. Amen to that. Okay, you can celebrate that. And so he says in verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Okay, he who has died has been freed from sin. So what Paul is saying, hey, is you've basically been dead to uh, sin. And because you're dead to sin, you're free from sin. Now, if you think of this in the natural way, uh, say, for example, you know, uh, a drunkard who dies, okay, a man who has been drinking all his life, and uh, he's he's dead. Now, once he is dead, he is free from the sin of alcohol, free from the addiction of alcohol and from drinking. Okay, so 
around his coffin, if you keep the most expensive alcohol, uh, full bottles around his body, he's uh, around his coffin, he's not going to get up and drink even a little bit. Okay? He can't because he is he's dead. Okay, He's dead to sin. And that is what Paul is basically saying in verses 6 and 7, that the old man is dead. And the sum totality of that sin that is controlling us, that is um, has made us slaves, that has um, had such a great addiction or a control of, we have been released from that. We are free from sin. And he's saying this is what has happened or this is what took place on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, you know, we died with him. Uh, our old man was crucified and the power of sin over our life was broken, was nullified, was done away with totally forever. And so today we can live a life free from sin. Okay, so this is what happened 2000 years back. But today Paul is saying, uh, since you and I identify with this um, last Adam, we identify with the second man, you know, we identify with him spiritually, you identify with what happened with him 2000 years back. Okay, so the truth that we are dead to sin in Christ, we are crucified in Christ, and the power of sin over our, of our life is broken is a truth, it's reality, is it is real, and it comes to us spiritually. So this is a spiritual truth uh, that you and I must walk in that spiritual truth today. So you and I can say that, hey, my old man is crucified in Christ, the body of sin was destroyed, the power of sin was destroyed, and that I'm no longer a slave of um, sin, I'm dead to sin, I'm free from sin, and we can say this because spiritually this is ours in Christ Jesus. Now the devil may want us to think that we are still subject to these things, uh, the devil does not want us to know this truth, to live this truth, to walk in these truths, but these are things uh, we are seeing here, and these are powerful truths that the Holy Spirit is revealed through the Apostle Paul. And if we know this truth, we can resist what the devil is telling us or putting on, on us as believers that, hey, it's okay for us to sin. You know, because why is it okay for us to sin? Because the grace of God is freely available. The grace of God is lavished upon us. God's, God has lavished his love upon us. So, hey, come on. He's not going to, you know, cast you in hell. Or he, he is not going to curse you. Remember, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Hey, you're going to learn that in Romans chapter 8. So these are some of the lies of the enemy. But we need to um, know this truth. Okay, that is what he says in um, verse uh, uh, six, knowing this, knowing this truth, not just knowing it, but believing it, accepting this truth and living in this truth, walking in this truth and keeping in step with this uh, truth. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about how we were dead and now we are alive once for all in verses eight to 10. So we will read verses 8 to 10 and then we would um, see what we can learn from eight, verses 8 to 10. Before that, anyone has any questions, any doubts? Verses 1 to 7? No? Okay, uh, we will move on to verses 8 to 10. So can somebody please read verses 8 to 10, please? Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, have, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has a dominion over him. For the death that, died, that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, uh, Subhashish. So in verse 8, Paul is saying that Christ died and rose again 
So the story does not just end with Christ's crucifixion and him dying on the cross. Um, so if we believe that we are united together or we are made one with Christ, uh, with him in his death, you know, as he's already revealed to us or spoken to us or written to us in verses four and five, he's saying, so we also need to believe that we have been united together with him in his burial. And so we also believe that we have also been united together with him in his resurrection. So he's saying, hey, we're not just identify or we don't just spiritually identify with Christ's uh, death on the cross, but we also, you know, are united with him. We, we identify with him in his burial and uh, his uh, resurrection. So, and he says that now, uh, since we have been dead with Christ, we have been buried with him, we have also been resurrected, we identify with him spiritually in this, we are united to get together with him, in, uh, spiritually with him in this, says, hence we also live with him. So Paul says, um, the rest of this is also true, okay, not only did we die with him, but the rest is also true that we also live with him. So when Christ was raised up from the dead, you know, death had no more control over him, okay? In the same way, these the things of the past, um, you know, that had a control over our lives, uh, sin, death, Satan, all of that has no longer any control over our lives, okay? So he's saying that when Christ was raised up from the dead, uh, death had no more control over him in the same way these past things, you know, we have put behind, have no more control over us. So what does Paul really mean? Uh, in verse 4, he says, we know that Jesus Christ was raised back to life by the glory of the Father. We also walk in newness of life. Okay. So says that, hey, once we are united with Christ, we identify with Christ spiritually, not only his death, but also in his burial and his resurrection, it means that when we are resurrected with Christ or we are united with Christ in his resurrection, or we identify with him spiritually in his resurrection, we are raised to walk in newness of life. Okay. So when he says when Christ was buried, we also was buried, what does he mean? It means that, you know, that the, uh, we, there is an end to the old life there is a full stop to the old life which means the old has no more claims on that person because the person is dead okay uh, the, there's no more claims on that person now let me give you an example from a present world for example if a man has a huge debt okay and he dies okay and uh, the person who he has borrowed from or the company that he has borrowed from has uh, put a, a you know filed them in a lawsuit okay put a case against him now this person has a huge debt and he is he dies and he's buried now the world has no more claims on his on him right no one can come to come and tell him hey wake up repay me you know of my money give my money and then you get sleep for ever amen uh, and the court case also that is against him no one can come and say hey wake up it's time for your court hearing you know today's your court hearing the court case because his body signif signifies that he has completely transitioned or uh, from the old to the to the next you know whatever okay uh, there's a release from the old. He's completely free, set free, broken off, you know, cut, off, cut off, severed from the old life. And the old life has no more claims on that man. Okay. In the same way, Paul is saying that when Christ was buried, we were buried with him. That means the old life has no more claims over, our, over us. Okay, sin has no more claim over us, addiction has no more claim over us, uh, death has no more claim over us, and Satan and being slaves to Satan has no more claims over our lives. Amen. Okay, so the old life has no more claims over us. And then he says, we were raised from the 
said, just like Christ, so we can walk in newness of life. So resurrection means what? You know, it means newness of life. So when Christ was crucified, we were also crucified. So how do we identify with it? It means the end of the old man, the breaking of the power of sin over our lives. The power of sin over our lives is totally broken. Now, what does, how do we identify with Christ's burial? Okay, it means the end of the old life. The old life has no more claims over us. Okay, or we have no more claims over the old life. So sin has no more claim over us. Law has no more claim over us. We are no longer under any condemnation. Okay, and resurrection means that we are given a brand new life. We are now living the eternal life. We're living the eternal life here and now. Okay. We'll come to talking about eternal life in just a little bit. And how do we identify with Christ's ascension? He says, hey, we are no longer under the influence of the systems of the evil and rebellion that is there in this world, like I explained um, last class on Monday. And how do we identify spiritually with being seated with Christ and the right hand of God is that, you know, um, we operate out of a place of authority and dominion on this earth, okay? So when he says that this is how we identify spiritually, this is what it really means. So when he says that, you know, uh, when we are resurrected with Christ, he says we are living the eternal life here and now. So eternal life is not something that will start the moment we die and we enter into heaven, it's not something that is um, eschatological hope, which means it's not just something that is way into the future, hope that's way into the future, but it's also something that is a realized eschatology. That means, yes, it's a something that is going to hap happen fully. There's a complete sense of it, the full sense of it that we will see that we will experience in totality when we get to heaven. But here now in the present, we also receive a taste of that eternal um, life, okay? Uh, because all this is applied to us in the instant, the right now moment when we accepted Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, we already start living, we already start walking in the eternal life here and now. And also the life of God, the nature of God begins to be operative in and through our lives here now in the present. Yes, we know that some part of it is, uh, you know, not fully complete. Um, uh, or some part of it is not yet true in our bodies, uh, that our bodies are mortal and we are going to the grave. But in our spirit, we have the eternal life. It's already there. And we know it will get better because we will receive uh, glorified bodies. We will no longer have these mortal bodies, but mortality will be changed into immortality. You know, we will receive glorified bodies and we will be with God in heaven but eternal life is already it's something that we realize now it's already started now inside us we are walking in the newness of life uh, we have the nature of god in our spirit man because we spiritually identify with christ's resurrection okay so this is what he means in um Verse 8, verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, that no longer has dominion over him. Again, okay, verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So verses 9 and 10, what did Christ die for? You know, what Christ died for, he died for once for all. The work is complete. It's a full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. The work is complete. That no longer has dominion over him. And it will always remain under him. Okay. So this is what he talks about, how we identify our spiritual truth of our identification or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the spiritual truth of our identification with Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then he moves on to five actions that we need to take to live a life free from sin 
in verses 11 onwards. So before we move on to verse 11, anyone has any questions, any doubts? Anything you'd like to share? Okay, if there are no questions, then we will move on to see the five actions to live free from sin. Uh, can somebody please read verse 11 to 14, please? Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its laws, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sins are not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. So was then, uh, you know, uh, Paul is pointing to Jesus. He says, you know, look to Jesus. He died, uh, you know, to sin once for all. And he lives, you know, and the life that he lives, he's alive and he lives to God. Okay. And then he begins verse 11. He says, likewise. So there is a connection. Okay, of what he's saying in verse 10 and what he's going to tell us now. He says, likewise means in the same manner, in the same way, just as Jesus died once for all to sin and he is alive once for all to God, which means he's fully consecrated and dedicated to the Father. He says, hence, in the same way, we also live in the same way. We also need to consider ourselves once for all dead to sin, completely dead to sin. And now we are completely alive to God, which means we're completely consecrated. We are completely dedicated to the Father. And then he presents five actions that we must take to live free from sin. Or he says the truth of identification is lived out like this. So he's he's presented the truth of our identification in chapter five, in chapter six. How you know um, uh, you know uh, how we identify with Adam, how we identify with the last Adam, how we identify with the natural man, the first man, how we identify with the spiritual man, the, uh, the second man. But now he goes on to say about how. You know, we must, and then he also talks about us, the spiritual truth of our identification uh, when he talks about uh, how we identify with him spiritually uh, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, and his him seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, based on the truth of our identification, how do we live our lives? So verse 11, he says, reckon yourself. And in verse 12, he says, don't let sin reign. Verse 13, he says, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness. Verse 13, he says, present yourselves to God. And verse 13, he also says, the fifth point, present your members as instruments of righteousness. Okay. So what does he mean when he says in verse 11, reckon yourself, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So reckon yourself means consider yourselves. Okay. In the Greek, it's an accounting word. It's a word that is used in the context of accounts, you know, accounting. Um, so I'll give you an example. Just like, say, a man has 10 notes. Uh, and each of those 10 notes are worth 10 rupees, okay? Um, however he counts these 10 notes in, in any which ways, he, he counts these 10 notes, it will amount to the same thing. It will amount to rupees 100, okay? Because 10 notes worth 10 rupees, okay? So it will amount to the same thing, rupees 100. It cannot be disputed. It cannot be question in any way. So he's saying the same way you reckon yourself. That means reckon yourself means count it as a fact. Consider yourself as someone who's dead to sin. And consider yourself as or count it as a fact that you are alive to 
So like Christ, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So likewise, a believer must say, hey, I'm dead to sin once for all, and I'm alive to God once for all. Okay, so it means that uh, once and for all, I embrace it, I accept it, I reckon it, I consider it, I take it as a fact that I'm dead to sin and alive to uh, God, which means I have nothing to do with sin, I have everything to do with God. So how do I do this? First, I reckon to sin, I'm done with sin because I'm dead to sin and alive to God. So as believers, you know, we need to come to this place where, you know, we have understood uh, our identification with Christ that I am dead to sin or I'm done away with sin. I reckon myself dead to sin. But the problem is that many of us believers, you know, we have never considered this truth or considered this fact that we are ourselves dead to sin, but we need to reckon uh, you know, we need to reckon ourselves that we are um, dead to sin and alive to God. The second thing he says is do not let sin reign, verse 12. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it uh, in its lust. So Paul is saying just because you have done away with sin, because you're dead to sin, alive to God, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. That means refuse to give sin any place in your body. Why? Because you're dead to sin, alive to God. So sin has absolutely no place in your life. And hence the believer becomes intolerant to sin. And then he says, present your members as instruments of righteousness. The third action point that we need to take is we need to present our members as instruments of right. Uh, un, do not present your members, sorry, as instruments of unrighteousness. You know, so he's saying here, by the act of our will or willingly or making a choice that your body is not going to be a weapon of sin and unrighteousness. Instrument basically means weapon, okay? So your body is not going to be a weapon of sin and unrighteousness. The fourth action point in verse 13, he says, present yourselves to God. Present your members as instruments of right, un, um, uh, sorry, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Okay, so again, he's saying this is the act of your will. This is something you need to make a choice that your body is not going to be a weapon of sin and unrighteousness, but we can say, God, you know, I present myself 100% to you uh, and my body as a weapon of righteousness, which means that, God, my body is going to advance righteousness. My body is going to yield to righteousness, walk in righteousness, live in righteousness. And the fifth action point there, here is present your members as instruments of um, Righteousness, he says, yield every member of your body to God so that every member serves as an instrument, which means as a weapon of righteousness. Okay. And then in verse 14, he says, For sin shall no longer have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Okay. Before we move on to verse 14, anyone has any questions about these five action points? No. Okay, verse 14, Paul says, you know, for sin shall not have dominion over you. So it's, Paul is saying sin has no right, no dominion over a believer. Then he says, you are not under the law, but under grace. So he's basically uh, drawing a contrast, uh, being under the law and being under grace. Now, he's already told us that you know the law what did the what was the law given the law was given because you know it told us what was the right thing to 
the law was given so that we can know that hey we have missed the mark we have sinned we have transgressed okay and also the law told us what is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do but the law did not empower us to do the right thing it only told us what is right and wrong but the law did not empower us to do the right thing but grace you know grace tells us what is the right thing to do but also grace empowers us to do the right thing okay so grace is the one that empowers us to do the right thing so the uh, and also we need to know that the standard un under grace is much greater is much higher than the standard under the law okay we know that in the old testament god says um, do not murder okay but in the new testament what does jesus say if anyone hates your brother you've already committed murder okay so if you hate someone you are a murderer so you know the standards of grace is much more higher the law says in the old testament do not commit adultery okay but grace says that even if you look lustfully at a woman you've already committed adultery in your heart hence we see that you know the standards under grace is much greater or higher than the standards of the law okay and now paul expands about law and you know grace further in chapter uh, seven but we will move on to uh, verse 15 where paul asked the second main question shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace verse 15 so we look at that and then he also presents um two um, questions to counter that or to answer that in verses 16 and 17 uh, so can somebody please read verses 15 to verse 18 please What then shall we sin? Uh, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that uh, though you are slaves to slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that forms of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. So here in verse 15, he asks the second main question, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And then to uh, explain that, he has two more questions. He says, verse 16, do you not know what that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? That is in verse 21, that's the second counter question. But verse 15, you know, uh, again, he asked this question, which is a rhetorical question. Uh, which he himself asks and he himself answers or you know the rhetorical question basically means the answer is very implicit it's just obvious it's just right there so he says what then shall we sin because we are under the law uh, not under the law but under grace and he says certainly not okay so he gives the answer why because he says you know I already told you to present yourselves to God okay so he's saying when you're presenting yourselves or you're submitting yourselves you are all already becoming a slave of who you're submitting or you are you know uh, presenting yourselves to so he says when you are under the law you are a slave of sin okay but under the grace you are now the slave of righteousness Okay, to so say when you were under the law, you were a slave of sin, but when you are under grace, now you are a slave of righteousness. 
when you were under the law, you were a slave of sin because law made it very evident that we could not keep the law. You know, made it very evident that we broke the law at various points. We just had no power, no strength in us to overcome sin, uh, to, uh, you know, not sin, but we ended up always yielding to sin and we ended up being slaves of sin. But under grace, we are slaves of God and we are slaves of righteousness. And he says, why are we slaves? Because he says, we have willingly presented ourselves to God. Okay. In verse 16, he says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now, the Greek word for slave here is doulos, meaning bond servant. And this is the same word that Paul refers to himself in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where he says, you know, that he's a bond servant of Christ. That means a bond servant who willingly, voluntarily uh, sub chose to submit himself to become a slave of or completely surrendered himself to the master for life to do what the master wants him to do, okay? And so he says that under the law, you are slave to sin, slave to uncleanliness and lawlessness. But under grace, you're a slave of God and slave to righteousness, okay? So in both these cases, you are a slave, but only the difference is the master is different. Okay, and in verse 13, he said, present yourselves to God. Means having presented ourselves to God, we now become slaves of God. We obey God and we are slaves of righteousness. Okay, or we are born servants of righteousness. It means that we have basically no option but to live a righteous life because we have made a willing choice to present ourselves to God. And while he says this, he says, you know, give thanks to God. Okay. And verse 17 and verse 18 says, but God we thank that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. So here he's making a contrast again, slave of sin, slave of righteousness. So he's saying, hey, you were slaves of sin. Having been set free from sin, now you become slaves of righteousness. So uh, how are you no longer slaves of sin? And now how are you slaves of righteousness? What made that difference? He's saying, what made the difference is because you obeyed from the heart. You obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine or teaching that was delivered to you. So they were given teaching. And what is that teaching? The same teaching that we are studying now, that we are going through, you know, or that we are looking at, we are studying, examining ourselves. This teaching took them from being slaves of sin to being set free from sin and becoming slaves of righteousness. And how did it happen? Because they obeyed from their heart. They wholeheartedly obeyed and they wholeheartedly gave themselves to this teaching. Okay. Now this word form, okay, um, form of doctrine which you were delivered to. The word form here basically means mold or a cast. Okay. So factories where they want to make something, they basically make a mold and pour the liquid, whether it is plastic or copper or gold or silver, they pour it into the mold. So here they're saying this teaching or doctrine that has brought to you uh, or that has been given to you is like a mold. So he's saying, hey, this teaching, this doctrine, which I'm presenting to you, which I'm giving to you now, you know, it is like a mold. and um, you know, when you have an obedient heart, your obedient heart is like a liquid that has been poured into that mold. 
Okay, so you're obeying, you're giving yourself, and you're being poured out into this mold, you're being poured out into this teaching and this doctrine. And when it solidifies, it comes out as something different. So he's telling the, the Jews, hey, if you're going to keep on teaching the law, sticking on to the law, holding to the law, then you are giving yourself, you're giving your heart to that mold or to that form or the doctrine of teaching. And what is the end result? What is going to come out? You're going to be slaves of sin, slaves of the law, slaves of uncleanliness and lawlessness. But he's saying if you obey and listen to this teaching and you give your heart to this teaching, this doctrine that I'm presenting you with here, you give it, you give your heart wholeheartedly to it. It's like your heart being poured out into this mold, this teaching and doctrine. And what is going to come out is different. You're going to be slaves of God. You know, you're going to live a life that is pleasing, holy, acceptable to God, and also walking in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life. Okay. So he's saying they are slaves of sin, but they have been set free from sin. Why have been why have they been set free from sin? Because they wholeheartedly accepted the teaching. The teaching was the mold that was cast in uh, cast them into being set free from being slaves of sin and becoming slaves of righteousness. And he's saying this is why this truth needs to be communicated to the believers, to the churches, to the believers, because this teaching is the mold. The teaching, the doctrine is the mold. And when people hold out to pour their hearts out, you know, the, the, the result is different. So when the church receives this truth wholeheartedly, what will happen? The word of God will produce the same results for them as it happened to the people back then in Paul's time. Okay, and then Paul goes on to sum up what he is saying uh, in verses nineteen to twenty-three. And we look at it um, on Monday. We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? So even as we leave, you know, remember that you are dead to sin, you know, count it as a fact that you're dead to sin, alive to God. Don't let your don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Present your members as instruments of uh, righteousness and not unrighteousness and present yourselves to God. Amen. Okay. Thank you for joining this class. Have a blessed weekend, a refreshing and a restful weekend and see you all on Monday. Thank you, everyone.